Uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you for joining us for this seminar on whistleblowing in the public interest. Um, we are going to run for an hour and we're going to look at the issue from the point of view of employment law and from media law. It's a seminar that came out of discussions that we were having in the office or in the virtual office and we think the topics are interesting and we hope that you will too. Uh, we're going to, this is the format in which we're going to run. We're going to, Paris is going to start looking at public interest disclosures from the employment point of view. Then Jonathan will follow up looking at the setting the scene from the media point of view. And then Beth will run disclosures to the media by employees. And then I'll look at some of the issues from the media perspective. So we are theoretically, with the usual barrister way with time limits, aiming at no more than 10 to 12 minutes each. And that will allow for a bit of time for questions and answers at the end. Now, you should be able to see on your screens somewhere, either top or bottom, depending on your device, a Q&A function. And we invite you to use that, please. Someone will be monitoring that and we'll select some questions to review at uh, the end of the session. So without further ado, I will hand over to Paras for the first part of this session. Thank you, Heather. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. My short talk as... Heather's explained, we'll be looking at the requirement for whistleblowing disclosures to be in the public interest under the Employment Rights Act 1996. And you'll see from the slide in front of you that the starting point, of course, is the words of the statute, namely section 43B of the Employment Rights Act, namely that a qualifying disclosure means any disclosure of information which in the reasonable belief of the worker making the disclosure is made in the public interest and tends to show a relevant failure. Now, you sometimes, or I sometimes see respondents challenging a disclosure on the basis that it, in fact, isn't true. For obvious policy reasons, it's not a requirement under Section 43B of the ERA for any disclosure of information to be factually correct. All that is required, and, and, and what a tribunal is particularly looking at, is the nature of the reasonable belief from the perspective of the worker making the disclosure. And the authority for that in the employment sphere is Darnton versus University of Surrey. In assessing whether there is a reasonable belief showing a re relevant failure, which is in the public interest by the worker, a tribunal will adopt an objective subjective assessment of that belief from the perspective of the whistleblower. And um, that can be seen in Korashi. We go to the next slide. Um, there are, in my view, two points, two key points to take away from Korashi concerning reasonable belief in so far as it pertains to the public interest under section 43. Firstly, that the assessment of a reasonable belief is informed by the position of the individual expressing that belief. Or to put it another way, a tribunal will more readily find that an accountant, for example, has formed a reasonable belief in a disclosure of information suggesting unlawful tax evasion and diversion of funds from HMRC in effect public funds, than a cleaner in an equivalent context. With respect to the cleaner, the tribunal may expect, or probably would expect a cleaner to take some further steps to verify or confirm the reasonable belief before it's considered reasonable, taking into account all the circumstances of the case. Now, for those of you who practice predominantly in media, uh, you, you'll be familiar with the Supreme Court decision in Serafin, which I know Jonathan's going to talk to you, to you all about um, later on today. And, and in particular, paragraph 65, which looks at when a section four defense, a public interest defense, um, is available under the Defamation Act and when it's made out. Um, you'll see there's a similarity in approach between the statutory regime under section four, and of course, the requirements under the Employment Rights Act for a reasonable belief pertaining to the public interest. The second point I wanted to make in relation to Karashi is where there are a number of disclosures asserted, and those of you who practice predominantly in employment will be familiar with this scenario, it's important for the claimant to establish a reasonable belief and a reasonable belief in the public interest in relation to each disclosure. They cannot be aggregated. Um, turning to the next slide, so dealing with public interest, firstly, in the employment sphere, the leading authority on whether a disclosure is in the public interest, um, it's, uh, in so far as employment disputes are concerned, is the Court of Appeal decision in Chesterton, which provided guidance in this area for tribunals to apply at first instance in determining whether a disclosure of information 
uh, is in the public interest or not. And some of the factors which a tribunal will take into account when assessing whether this is the case include the matters on the slide. Firstly, the numbers in the group whose interest the disclosure serves. So the larger the group affected by the potential disclosure of information, remember whether it's correct or not, it's more likely to tick the public interest aspect. The second point is the nature of interests affected and or the magnitude to, to which those interests are affected by the wrongdoing. So effectively, is it solely a private or financial matter? Does it affect, for example, the working environment, the public at large? What is the, the disclosure aimed at and what does it show? Thirdly, the nature of, the, of wrongdoing disclosed is also relevant in ascertaining whether the public interest aspect of the test is met, namely deliberate wrongdoing being more in the public interest than an accidental error, for instance. And then finally, um, another factor is the identi identity of the alleged wrongdoer. Are we talking about a large prominent employer or even a public body potentially committing the wrong? public body, larger employer, more likely to invoke public interest considerations. If we go to the next slide, please. Now, it's important to note, in, in so far as the Employment Rights Act, the term public interest isn't actually defined within the statute. And accordingly, um, the tribunals and the courts have taken a case-by-case -case basis to this um, term, and, and it covers a very wide range of issues. But it is important at this juncture, and we're going to circle back to it towards the end of my part of the talk, to note an observation made by Lord Wilberforce in British Steel and Granada Television, namely that there is a wide difference between what is interesting to the public and what it is in the public interest to make known. Where the issue of public interest in respect of a disclosure is disputed, it is for a tribunal to find as a matter of fact, as a fact-finding tribunal, whether the disclosure was in fact made in the public interest. And an example of that can be seen in Parsons where disclosures made during a disciplinary dispute were considered to be wholly in the claimant's self-interest and therefore not having the requisite public interest um, motivation behind it, as well as the disclosure of the information. Now, the Court of Appeal decision in Ibrahim is a useful reminder that the claimant's personal motivation for making a disclosure is irrelevant, and the focus should always be on whether there is a genuine reasonable belief that the disclosure is in the public interest. And we're gonna come on to the issue of mixed motivation shortly. If we go to the next slide. Now the ICO has published guidance on the meaning of public interest in the context of freedom of information requests, which may serve a useful function in appropriate cases when assessing whether a disclosure is in the public interest or not. And of particular interest to employment practitioners are potentially the references in the citation there to integrity and fair treatment. In particular, fair treatment could be, could be seen as arguably encompassing anti-discrimination um, uh, claims or disclosures of information. And uh, another authority I just wanted to bring to your attention is, is a case called Fairhall, which is an interesting EAT decision handed down about 10 days ago, 30th of June, maybe my maths wrong, maybe 15 or 16 days ago now, um, where reference is made um, in the EAT decision at paragraph five to the tribunal at first instance, opining that deficiencies in the standard of care provided by the NHS must always be a matter of public interest, which if we go back to the Chesterton principles, one of the factors is of course, whether the wrongdoing is committed by a public body, of course, the NHS is a public body. Um, and the next slide shows an interesting decision on whether a worker has a reasonable belief in a disclosure being in the public interest, um, namely that of OQU, versus Rise Community Action. Now, uh, the facts in summary in this case, Rise was a charity, is a charity, providing support for individuals amongst other things, affected by domestic violence and female genital uh, mutilation. Oku was engaged as a worker, and during a probationary period, various performance issues arose, which led to the extension of her probationary period and subsequent dismissal. Now, prior to her dismissal, but after the extension of her probationary period, Oku made disclosures of information con concerning various breaches of the Data Protection Act um, due to the processing of sensitive personal data, which, which she handled as a matter of course. And what she said was a failure by RISE to provide secure storage and a personal mobile phone. Now, the Employment Tribunal at first instance held that Oku's disclosures were not made in the public interest as they solely concerned her own contractual position and performance. However, the EAT on appeal considered that the tribunal had erred 
and that Oku's disclosures couldn't have just related to her own position, as they inevitably touched upon the position of service users, i.e. the service users of, o of um, RISE, and reiterated that the public interest need not be the only motivation or reason for the disclosure to qualify for protection. Um, turning to the next slide, um, a very recent EAT authority um, on the issue of public interest is, is Dobby, and that was handed down on the 11th of February this year. And some general observations in conjunction with the Court of Appeal decision in Chesterton were made, um, which I've set out on that slide, and just running through the six of them uh, very quickly. The first, of course, is a recitation of what I referred to um, earlier in, in my talk about Lord Wilberforce in British Steel, namely that a matter of public interest doesn't necessarily equal something of interest to the public, the two are distinct. Secondly, the possibility that a disclosure may never come to the attention of the public does not, in appropriate cases, undermine the inherent public interest in that disclosure. Thirdly, a disclosure of information in respect of a one-off incident is still in the, can still be in the public interest. There is no requirement for repetition or potential repetition for the public interest aspect to be made out. Fourthly, uh, and this is more a reasons um, point, the tribunal should give reasons for the determination as to whether a disclosure is either in the public interest or not, as the case may be. Um, fifthly, there's a presumption that disclosures which fall within the necessary statutory regime at 43B1 A to F will be in the public interest. And that's primarily due to the nature of the failures they show, which, which is a matter of common sense, a breach of a legal obligation, endangerment to the environment, um, uh, commission of a criminal offence, all of those matters are potentially those prima facie in the public interest and so will qualify for protection. And then finally, reiterating that purely private matters are not in the public interest, but as we've seen with Oku, mixed matters may be. So that's my bit of the talk done, and that leads us neatly on to Jonathan Price, who will be exploring the concept of the public interest in respect of publications from a media context. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Paris. I'm going to uh, briefly survey how the public interest arises and is deployed in publication um, cases. And um, I'm going to do that by introducing the topic from uh, the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, because handily they don't recognize the same sort of silos that we do in publication cases and their um, statements are of pretty broad application. Uh, and then I will enter the silos and I will run through some of the uh, publication causes of action and see where public interest slots in. So Ray, if you could give me um, the, oh, it's there, I beg your pardon. So the, the, the um, the pretty, pretty well-known um, position of the European Court of Human Rights in its um, determination of Article 10 cases in relation to the press is that the press acts as the public watchdog and um, as such merits a high degree of protection. The, uh, this is consistent with the jurisprudence of the Strasbourg Court, which consistently places the right to freedom of expression protected by Article 10 at the heart of what is necessary in a democratic society. Um, and it's worth remembering that it's not simply the right to say stuff, but it's the right to know stuff, to, to the right to receive information, the public's right to receive information um, with which Article 10 is concerned. And in that context, um, the court has repeatedly said that it's not just that the press has a right to report what's in the public interest, but a duty uh, to impart, in a manner consistent with its obligations and responsibilities, information and ideas on all matters of public interest. And it has that duty because that is the corollary of the um, right of the public to that information. And I've used the quote here from the Blair Tromso case. Um, because uh, it, that's a grand chamber decision. Um, I mean, the same principle has been repeated throughout the cases, but um, that, it, that, that was a decision about um, the identification um, or, and um, discussion of some private uh, the information relating to some private individuals 
um, in the context of reporting on a matter of some public interest. Um, and uh, there was a dissent and three judges, in fact, four judges dissented, but in a dissenting opinion of three of them, um, I've extracted this pithy uh, epithet. In our view, the fact that a strong public interest is involved should not have the consequence of exonerating newspapers from either the basic ethics of their trade or the laws of defamation. And um, between these two quotes, so the majority opinion and this um, extract from the dissenting opinion, you find the tension um, that drives the whole of the um, law relating to disclosure in the public interest as it relates to publication cases. And um, that uh, thread uh, the, 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 this, um, that I've that that tension is evident still in, in the most recent decisions, decisions in the High Court in this jurisdiction. Um, so the uh, next slide, please, Ray, which is um, again about the convention approach, because it, um, what I want to get across here is that um, there is another uh, tension, if you like, this time not just in the, in the substance of the application, but in the jurisprudential approach. Um, in the Sunday Times in UK case, uh, the European Court uh, sought to establish that the correct approach is not to, to seek to balance rights or conflicting rights or principles, but to start with the uh, principle that, um, that freedom of expression, in particular as it relates to public interest disclosure, uh, is, is paramount, and then to work uh, with the least restrictive derogations from that principle. Um, the court is faced not with a choice between two conflicting principles, but with a principle of freedom of expression that is subject to a number of exceptions. Of course, those are well known, the, the, the article 102 exceptions, and they must be strictly interpreted. Um, and for, uh, and then I've set out uh, just uh, for reference, the three, the three part test that the European court uses to assess the, um, lawfulness of the interference it must be prescribed by law, it must pursue a legitimate aim and be necessary in a democratic society, and consistently where the public interest is in play, the scrutiny uh, will be intense. Now that um, is not, uh, in fact, how, the, uh, how public interest has been deployed in practice, either in, in the European court or in, in, certainly not domestically, where the, um, the starting point um, is frequently ignored. And the, the, the domestic courts have uh, really struggled with this principle of a duty um, on uh, publishers to publish matters that are in the public interest. And they prefer to look at it as balancing of rights, as we'll come to see. So just then, um, descending from our lofty uh, principled perch into a domestic application. Um, we'll starting point, well, we'll start with defamation um, and the recently introduced defense under section four of the Defamation Act, which is publication on a matter of public interest. And um, that this of course grew out of uh, what was the Reynolds, uh, known as the Reynolds defense, which you know, was originally considered to be um, a species of qualified uh, privilege, although that is no longer thought to be the case, um, which um, was a recognition in English law that uh, newspapers were under this duty to impart information in the public interest and, and the public had a, a right, a corresponding right to, uh, uh, to receive such information. And this was put on a statutory footing um, in section four it replaces the Reynolds defense, and it has the following three elements that come out of the strict um, construction of the draftings. So the statement must be on a matter of public interest. The defendant must uh, believe that publishing it is in the public interest, and that belief will be tested for its reasonableness. And of these three elements, the first is um, purely objective and should be a fairly uh, easy exercise for determination. Um, I say it's all, the same it must be on a matter of public interest, but um, it may be included uh, in a 
statement that is on a matter of public interest. The second element is subjective, but must be proved. Um, so the defendant must uh, assert and prove that they believed at the time that they published the statement that it was in the public interest to publish it. And in the recent case of um, La Chaux, which at the trial of which was in February, March this year, decision handed down um, the week before last, the uh, independent, there were two defendants, the independent and the standard, and the independent failed at the second hurdle, the standard succeeded, at, but failed at the third. Um, the, but partly because the case went to the Supreme Court on the issue of serious harm under section one, and therefore, um, wasn't tried until seven years after the events. The witnesses for the independent were not able to persuade Mr. Justice Nicklin um, that they did believe at the time that they published the article that it was in the public interest to do so. They were not able to persuade him because they frankly, very frankly said that they couldn't actually remember uh, their thought processes at the time and he wasn't prepared to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to move on um, without going into the, 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 the Seraphin case, because although um, it, dug, it, it is a Supreme Court decision dealing with um, Section 4, the pronouncements in it on Section 4 are relatively limited to correcting a couple of errors by the Court of Appeal. Of course, it's, it, um, its main uh, interest was in the point about the unfair trial. So I'll, I'll move on. Uh, just to look at how the defence arises in um, confidence and privacy cases. The functions of the public interest in breach of confidence cases, which is the, the, the um, cause of action out of which privacy has grown, um, are potentially threefold. It, it acts possibly as a limit on the scope of the duty, um, the duty of confidence. It can negate the duty altogether, the old principle that there's no confidence in iniquity, so that the um, confidentiality doesn't subsist, it doesn't get off the ground. Or, as is as tends to be the case now, um, the issue of public interest can serve as a defence to an otherwise um, well-formed action in privacy or breach of confidence. And that tends to be how we think of it these days, um, as a defence. Um, and the origins of that are probably in the spycatcher case citation for which is there and I've, I've chosen a quote from it relevant to that. Um, moving on then through privacy and breach of to data protection, we find another statutory scheme this time in the 2018 Act, Data Protection Act, which is um, more complex still than Section 4 of the Defamation Act, but has some similarities, um, but is more prescriptive. And I've tried to express this as, as a sort of logical proposition. Um, it's not quite how it's drafted, but it's pretty close. Um, so this is the part of the Data Protection Act dealing with um, special purposes, um, which includes journalism and literature, and so on. And um, if you are processing personal data with a view uh, to publication of it in, in uh, such a, uh, it, through such materials, so journalistic or, or literary material, and you reasonably believe that um, publishing it would be in the public interest, which is the same test as under section four, the Defamation Act, then certain listed GDPR provisions don't apply, but they only don't apply to the extent that the controller reasonably believes that the application of those provisions would be incompatible with the special purposes with publication of uh, literature or journalistic material. So it's fairly um, convoluted, but uh, and it re does require um, a fair degree of um, prior thinking by the, the journalist. And um, in light of the Le Show and Sikri decisions, and Heather will mention this, I think, when she deals with those in due course, it could be quite uh, onerous to rely on this because you're going to have to document everything, all of your thought processes uh, before the court would accept them. And there's, uh, there's a sort of fairly complex decision tree that might be needed uh, to do that. And it doesn't end there. Um, the, the Data Protection Act goes on to specify that um, 
the controller, i.e. in this case, the, the journalist or, or editor must take into account in their thought process and therefore must also document that, uh, the, the special importance of the public interest in freedom of expression and information. And um, they must have regard to the codes of practice uh, it, it, to the extent that those are relevant um, and, and the uh, codes of practice and guidelines are, are, are listed there, the BBC editorial guidelines, the Ofcom code or the editor's code of practice. Um, of course, it, um, the, these provisions apply to people who publish outside of organisations that are strictly regulated by these codes. And so um, they would not have to have a regard for them because they wouldn't be relevant. Now I'm going to have to move on because I, I can see I've been a little bit uh, slow. The final thing I was going to try to deal with was, in the context of publication cases, the problem of defining what the public interest is. And I'll whiz through this. I mean, the short answer is it's difficult and there's no single definition, as the BBC editorial guidelines make clear. Um, but uh, there are a number of sources, and I haven't listed them all by any means, um, that might be uh, worth consulting if you're seeking to um, define what the public interest is for publication purposes. Um, and um, Ray, if you could move on through um, the next couple of slides, you'll see that I've taken quotes from Reynolds and from uh, the European Court, and finally from um, the Philip Green case. And then the, my last slide, which is where I'll, I'll leave you, um, is, is a list that I've extracted from those sources of matters um, which are relevant to the subsistence of the public interest. So uh, the B, as the BBC guidelines make clear, it includes freedom of expression. That sounds rather circular from a, a logical point of view, because um, if you are a journalist processing data and seeking to rely on the exemptions in the Data Protection Act, you must have regard to the special importance of freedom of expression in assessing whether or not it's in the public interest uh, to process the data and the extent to which um, that your exemptions apply. And if there is a um, public interest in freedom of expression itself, it seems that you may have already satisfied that simply by expressing yourself. But I'm sure that's not what's intended in the BBC guidelines, but that's what it says. There is a public interest in providing information that assists people to comprehend decisions on matters of public importance, which um, Paris had picked up on in a lot of the employment cases, um, will rely on that. The prevention of people being misled is, is frequently used um, in privacy cases, but um, the degree to which people are misled and the nature of what they're being misled about is, is important. You can't simply go around correcting white lies or, or, or minor fibs uh, and relying on the public interest. Exposing or detecting crime is generally always in the public interest. Um, exposing corruption, justice, significant incompetence or negligence. And as was made clear in Reynolds, this isn't confined to political discussion in Reynolds. Uh, itself, um, the court was invited, it was the House of Laws that was invited um, to establish the defence that became the Reynolds defence, uh, according to a definition that included uh, political speech. And um, the court declined to do that, finding that, that, that they shouldn't be de defining the public interest at all. And therefore, the um, public interest is broader than simply political matters. So it's not confined to political discussion. It includes information relating to sporting or performing artists. This is, was established in a number of European Court of Human Rights decisions. Um, and as the Philip Green case made clear, standards of conduct in public or commercial life are generally in the public interest. Uh, and it is in the public interest to expose uh, private individuals in their capacity uh, as uh, commercial uh, senior figures in commercial uh, uh, commercial organizations, as Philip Green was. Um, and the public interest must account for changing perceptions of the kind of behavior by people in positions of power. So it needs to be elastic and it needs to change over time. Speaking of time, my time is up and I will hand over, I think now to, to Beth. Good afternoon, everybody. Next slide, please, Ray. 
Um, so employees who make disclosures to the media face, or former employers as well who make disclosures to the media, face a number of potential problems. The most likely is that they will be in breach of a duty of confidence relating to the information they've acquired. This would either be the general duty of confidence or a specific and contractual duty of confidence. Even where they are not under such a duty, they may, be un may have contractual obligations not to make com comments which are adverse or derogatory, even if it's not confidential. And another matter in ma manner in which an employee or former employee might find themselves in difficulty is <clears throat> that a disclosure may amount to defamation of the company in question, or individuals at or related to the company, or disclosures may even amount to harassment under the Protection from Harassment Act 1997. This is sometimes surprising to uh, practitioners when they hear this. How on earth could a protected disclosure ever amount to harassment? There is, in fact, uh, some case authority on this point, not necessarily always finding in favour of this, although in the case of Per Thompson Ladeck, which I'll come to again, uh, indeed it was found that the employees' repeated attempts to make the disclosures did amount to harassment. And for those of us who practice in employment law, or indeed those of us who uh, sometimes advise in whistleblowing cases uh, for the media, we can see how this might arise because many whistleblowers do become very focused on attempting to make the public aware of what they perceive to be a grave failure or a serious injustice. And there are many times in which they will, perhaps out of frustration at how the employer or the company is handling it or how the regulator is handling it, um, continue to make the disclosure in increasingly agitated terms. Moving on to the next slide, please, Ray. Now, the public interest defence, whether it's for breach of confidence or privacy or defamation, may protect the employee or the former employee in terms of a civil action, but it won't protect them if they are still in role from experiencing any sanction which the employer wishes to impose on them. Um, and moreover, the um, and they may also be sanctioned for disclosures, even if those don't amount to a breach of confidence, and even if there isn't any direct contractual provision to sanction an employee. Equally, the courts, the civil courts, that is, will often um, consider and indeed should consider the provisions around protected disclosures if they are looking at an injunction uh, application uh, for breach of confidence or privacy. <coughs> or under the Protection from Harassment Act, and they will normally carve out an appropriate route through for disclosures, including disclosures to the media in order to protect the employee or the former employee's Article 10 rights. So if we move on to the next slide, we see the relevant legislative provisions under the Employment Rights Act 1996 uh, from sections 40C, 43C to H, there are different manners in which um, different types of disclosures may be made in order to qualify for protection. Um, so section 43C concerns disclosures to an employee or other responsible persons. The, the most relevant for the purposes of the media are disclosures to third parties under disclosures under section 43G and disclosures of exceptionally serious failures under section 43H. Section 43J also provides that any contractual duty of confidence is void if it purports to prevent such a protected disclosure from being made. Moving on. 
each um, section of se moving from section 43C to H creates an escalating tier of disclosure, each requiring a greater degree of justification. The lowest level of justification is for a disclosure made directly to the employer or a responsible person. A general disclosure made to a third party requires, as we will see, some specific conditions to be fulfilled. And a disclosure to a third party which doesn't fulfill those conditions under Section 43H must meet a threshold requirement of being exceptionally serious. And the basis for this in policy arises from the principle that a breach of a duty of confidence even if that may be justified, has increasingly serious or potentially serious outcomes for the company or um, people associated with that company, the further away that disclosure moves from individuals in the company itself and the further towards the world at large. And that potential damage has to be um, managed against the importance of the disclosure being made. The usual route through, turning to the next slide please, Ray, is section 43G. And in order to qualify for protection under this, the employee must believe that the disclosure they have made is true and such a belief must be reasonable. They must not make a disclosure for the purposes of personal gain. They must meet a further condition and they must also meet the general criteria of, um, of proving that it, is, it has been reasonable for them to make this in all the circumstances. Moving on, the threat, the conditions we see at 43G are they, that is where an employee makes a uh, disclosure to a third party, which can include a media organisation, is if they believe they'll be victimised by the employer, if there isn't a prescribed person outside the employer to make the disclosure to, and they believe that evidence would be concealed or destroyed, or if they've already made the disclosure and had no, um, no effective result from having done so. And then as we move on, we will see that, again, reflecting the test for public interest, which Paris described before, um, but this time for a disclosure to a third party under section 43G, the employee must prove a reasonable belief in the substantial truth of uh, the information and the allegations being made. This again is a subjective objective test. Uh, applying some of the considerations around public interest, uh, which Jonathan talked about before, there, the failure to seek verification may well be relevant if there's no real urgency. Now, the test of reasonable belief in truth is different from the considerations of public interest, but there is an overlapping framework for making the assessments. And if we look at Chesterton, we see that the question is, what does the employee believe subjectively? And is that belief objectively reasonable? That was the belief for public interest. And again, we see that in the, in the test for truth. Now, in the case of Le Show, the um, High Court considered the relevant tests under the Employment Rights Act and in terms of expanding the scope of what public interest was. And the important point to take away is that this is a why this test has wider parameters than the test which is applied in defamation and the court can reasonably um, can re can make a finding that a belief is reasonably held on different grounds to those advanced by the employee in question. If we move on. Personal gain is a particularly pertinent aspect of this, of this issue when it comes to disclosures to the media. Um, the prohibition on making a disclosure for the purposes of per personal gain 
was indeed partly to prevent checkbook journalism and to prevent employees making disclosures because <coughs> they thought they could get some money out of a paper or a broadcaster for doing so. But the relevant statutory provisions uh, don't expressly preclude receipt of money. They preclude um, making it for the purpose, but not having that result. And they don't deal with mixed motives. They also don't, um, don't preclude donations to charities or payments to family members. Now, this can make the question of whether the employee has made the disclosure or the former employee has made the disclosure for personal gain a difficult one to um, former hard view as to as to whether it will get over the line or not because for example if the employee makes the disclosure over a nice lunch in a restaurant but that lunch was chosen for convenience or if the employee chooses a newspaper who would pay over a newspaper who wouldn't, but always intended to make that disclosure and can indeed demonstrate that they, um, they had approached both, they would have gone with both, and that payment was not at the forefront of their minds, then there is considerable, there is considerable potential ambit under the legislation for that disclosure to nonetheless fall within the parameters of a protected disclosure. There is comparatively limited case law on this issue. The one case I've identified, which is Golwell, um, interpreted personal gain in an expansive sense as for the employee's own ends. This was a non-binding decision for first instance employment tribunal, although it strikes me that other employment tribunals would likely find similar and an employee would probably be ill-advised to push this point too hard in terms of an appeal to the EAT or above. But at the moment, there's comparatively little law on the subject. Moving on. Reasonableness in all the circumstances is the catch-all test at the end. That considers the identity of the person to whom the disclosure is made, the seriousness of the failure, um, the continuation or likely reoccurrence, and if any action was taken in accordance with the previous disclosure. In other words, if the failure is not serious, unlikely to occur in the future and the um, employer took immediate steps to rectify the situation, then an employee is going to find it much more difficult, even if all the other criteria are satisfied, to uh, rely on section 43G for a disclosure to the media than they would do, um, than they would do otherwise. If an employee cannot rely on section 43G, moving on again, please, um, there, the legislative pr provision that would, could potentially give them protection is under section 43H, but this is confined to exceptionally serious failures. This does not require a reasonableness in the circumstances test, although it, emphasizes and it brings to the forefront regard the identity of the person to whom the disclosure is made and it does not require that the conditions under section 43 g2 are fulfilled for example that the employee is fearing victimization or there is no prescribed person to make it to we see some overlap with the previous provision however in that, again, the reasonable belief in the substantial truth is required and it cannot be for the purposes of personal gain. But the biggest difficulty that any individual would have in making a disclosure and relying on section 43H is overcoming the threshold of exceptional seriousness. If we go to the next slide, please, Ray. This is a fully objective criterion. And we can see from the examples I've given on this slide how it might be interpreted. In Bolkovec, 
we see that information, disclosure of information about women and girls being trafficked was an exceptionally serious failure. And the presence of asbestos at National Trust properties in Collins was also an exceptionally serious failure. But fully objective is a difficult criterion to establish in any case. And as I said earlier, one of the salient features we often see in whistleblowing cases is that of an individual who develops something of a campaigning focus on the issue or who becomes increasingly concerned and focused on the problem over time. And the difficulty with that increasing concern and focus and that campaigning focus is that very often the individual in question finds it harder and harder to make that objective analysis as to the degree of seriousness of the failing. And indeed, this is also an issue we see more generally from the perspective of people working within the organization, within an organization. If what that organization does is what concerns somebody for the entirety of their working lives, then it is easier for them to attribute exceptional seriousness than it is for the outsider. So again, this is a criteria which, um, which I urge caution in the interpretation of for a range of reasons. Although if it can be met, it provides a very attractive and much more wide ranging route through to protection for a disclosure to the media than under section 43G because the, the hurdles of, um, who, of what you must have done first are not required. Moving on, please, Ray. The identity of the disclosee, as I said before, comes to the forefront in this section. And we see this in the parliamentary debate before the Public Interest Disclosure Act, which amended the Employment Rights Act, um, came into force. The government firmly believed that where exceptional, exceptionally serious matters are at stake, work, workers should not be deterred from raising them. This does not mean that people should be protected when they act wholly unreasonably, for example, by going straight to the press where there could clearly have been some other less damaging way to resolve this. As we can see, this emphasizes that policy consideration I referred to before about ensuring that a disclosure, even if it should be made, causes the least damage possible. And therefore the increasing tiers of obligation on the individual making the disclosure, depending on, um, the, on who they've, they've made that too. And indeed, as we see in this extract from the parliamentary debate, the uh, minister at the time envisaged that going straight to the press would usually be a wholly unreasonable way to proceed. And we must interpret from that wording of section 43H and the regard to be had for the identity of the disclosee that going to the press will often be wholly unreasonable even if the disclosure is objectively of an exceptionally serious failing. Moving on, please, Ray. This reflects the position, in fact, in civil law going to a breach of confidence. And we see one of the seminal cases on breach of confidence, spy catcher number two, Lord Griffith's comment that in some circumstances, the public interest might be better served by a limited form of publication, perhaps to the police or some other authority who can follow up a suspicion of a wrongdoing, which may lurk beneath the cloak of confidence those authorities will be under a duty not to abuse the confidential information and to use it only for the purposes <coughs> of their inquiry. That said, if we turn over, we see here a number of unreported cases in which the Employment Tribunal has found that going straight to the press is in fact reasonable. In Kay and Northumberland, the individual in question wrote a satirical open letter to the Prime Minister about uh, the shortage of beds in the hospital. 
in Mansey and Bradford, again, a decision against an NHS trust, it was reasonable to go on television to rebut criticisms of a colleague. What is, I say, relevant about both of those cases is that although they were whistleblowing cases, as we can see from some of the facts that, um, that are contained, these were not cases in which there was uh, much of an issue of confidence in, at stake. Uh, certainly, it is rarely, uh, if ever, uh, confidential information as to there being a shortage of beds in an NHS hospital, and equally the criticisms of the colleague in question in Mansi had already been made in public. So although, although these decisions perhaps on the face demonstrate a latitude that uh, isn't quite envisaged in the parliamentary debates and in spy catcher, I think once we look at the substance of the information involved, we see a much clearer application of those same principles. Moving on. Of course, most employees will not be making protected disclosures to the media in the course of their employment, partly because they suspect or know that they would not be able to meet any criteria under section 43G or H, especially if they're being legally advised or advised effectively by some other body, but also because they don't wish to jeopardize their employment. The most common point in my experience for somebody to make these sorts of disclosures, and in the modern world, these aren't necessarily disclosures to a journalist, they might be disclosures on the social media to the world at large in the hope of those being picked up by a journalist is after the employment has come to an end. And indeed, I've also seen a number of cases where not only has the employment come to an end, but the individual in question has signed and very happily, uh, or the employer assumed very happily agreed to sign at the time of departure, a settlement agreement with non-disclosure um, provisions. Those non-disclosure provisions are usually included to, um, obviously, to give a degree of, or to um, impute a contractual duty of confidence on the individual to prevent such disclosures in um, circumstances where otherwise the employer will have no further reach over them they're having left the course of employment and the information in question not objectively having a duty of confidence independent of the contractual provisions of the settlement agreement. And the usual assumption or hope on behalf of the employer is that the um, employee won't won't, or the former employee won't make a disclosure, partly because they'll be in uh, fear of um, being injuncted by the High Court, but also because they don't want to repay any money offered under a settlement agreement. And very often employers will um, make it known that the sum being offered is being offered because they are trying to buy the employee's silence. Now, if we look at the wording of section 43J, this section applies to any agreement between a worker and his employer, whether a worker's contract or not, including an agreement to refrain from instituting or continuing any proceedings under this Act or any proceedings for breach of contract. And this is a provision which may well be cited in terms of a settlement agreement and in terms of action in respect of a settlement agreement. Now, one argument which may be wrong is that if a non-disclosure clause is void, the employer cannot recover damages because the worker or the former worker is not breaching a valid clause. So the employer cannot recover any proportion of uh, what they paid out as part of that termination. The solution which some employers consider to um, ensure that they, they might be able to retain the confidentiality of the agreement in these circumstances is an apportionment of some of the sums specifically um, in, 
in respect of the confidentiality provisions. And when we think about this, on the face of it, this might well make sense because in providing consideration for a settlement agreement, yes, an employer is usually trying to buy the silence of the former employee, but they are usually also trying to prevent disputes going um, proceeding to legal action. And there may well be other matters which they are also trying to resolve and therefore apportionment might be considered a sensible way forward. Um, and however, the danger of a clause which would um, sp apportion a specific sum for confidentiality is twofold. On the one hand, if the sum is too low, it simply becomes a paying proposition for the employee to breach the term of the NDA if five out of a thirty thousand pound five thousand out of a thirty thousand pound settlement is for their silence they may well take the view that that can sit in a bank account attracting interest until the employer uh, seeks recovery of the same um, alternatively if the sum is too high there would be a different problem, which is that the employer would find themselves um, in breach of the rule in contract law against penalty clauses, because that would be considered penal and out of proportion to what the settlement agreement was really about. Of course, this proceeds on the assumption that the disclosure in the first place would fall under sections 43G or section 43H and has met all the other valid criteria. Uh, that brings my slides to an end. So moving on now to Heather. Well, I can see that we're coming up to our hour, but um, I, th I think I can get through uh, my, uh, well, I need to say in about 10 minutes. So I hope the people who are kind enough to attend can manage to stay a little bit longer. Um, apologies for barristers and time estimates, we know what they're like. Um, the, the, turning to the question for the media, the, 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 the big question, of course, is you know, are you going to be able to publish or will the court grant an injunction? And that could be an interim injunction or final injunction. And it's interesting when Jonathan was talking about whether the starting point in Strasbourg, if you're thinking about Article 10, is you, you start with the freedom and then you have to look for a justification to um, restrict it that's got to be necessary etc it's not quite that way it's working it seems to me that you've got the two big ticket items you've got on the one hand <clears throat> confidentiality we're really talking about confidential information here um, and, um, and and the, the interest in disclosure and there are two they're two big items uh, and the, and the well-known um, uh, uh, distillation into a single paragraph which is always lovely when a judge does it um, in, in the Ries case when you've got article 8 privacy which of course encompasses reputation on the one hand and article 10 on the other is the court takes the two big rights and they've got equal status and then looks at the justification for interfering or restricting with them and then applies a proportionality test and then this is going to be a message that runs through these kind of thoughts about how this works which is you, you you've got the big you've got the big picture issues but you've got to really drill down into the facts uh right can you go to the next slide of paris talked about the balance and this was in the in the context of FOIA, which of course is a specific um the, the framework intended really to give a general right of access as section one says to information that's held by public authorities and it's good that there's a very wide uh, uh, uh approach to public interest on, from the ICO, but turning to the next slide, um, th th that's followed by in the, in the ICO guidance to the recognition of these two, two sides of the coin. You've got on the one hand the big interest in, um, in, in disclosure, but on the other hand there's an interest in confidentiality, giving space for discussion of decisions so that policy can be made, giving space for investigations to be carried out with, with integrity so that they can be, be effective. And so you, we've got, even in that context where you've got, as I said, the general right is about getting information to the public held by public authorities, you've got that balance uh, kicking in. Uh, Ray, turning over to the next one, we've just got Article 10. Everybody knows what Article 10 says. It's a qualified right. Jonathan's talked about the balance. And you've got those com the competing factors in their interest in national security being one of them, which is a high, high end of confidentiality, reputational rights of others and disclosure of information returned in, com in confidence. Um, on to the next one, please. Interim injunctions. Bit of protection here for um, someone seeking to publish. 
it's not the old American standard test where you start with, is there a serious issue that needs to be tried, move on to the balance of convenience and game over. There's a recognition that the interim injunction is the game it is, and it's game over if you, quite often if you fail at that stage if you want to publish. Uh, and the applicant has to show that, they're, that they are likely to establish a trial that publication shouldn't be allowed. Now that's generally going to mean probably succeed at trial, more likely than not to succeed at trial. <clears throat> there's a bit of flexibility in that for very early stages where there's a there's high risk of, 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 of damage where the court just wants to hold it over to a return date. Bit of flexibility, but basically you've got to prove you've got to win a trial. Uh, next slide, again, these are just sort of reminders about where we are, section 12.4 of the Human Rights Act, if the court's thinking about granting relief, which might affect the right to, to freedom of expression, the court's got to have particular regard to the importance of the convention right. Well, you know, so how far does that take you? Because the convention right is itself a qualified right. And as judges, including Lord Justice Sedley, said, if you can't think about Article 10 without thinking about Article 8 as well. So you so you it, it kind of it's just it doesn't really take you anywhere, but at least it reminds the court it's got to think about freedom of expression. Okay, so so the, those very big sort of general issues aside, where, where are you going to end up if you end up in court? Next slide on the one side. On the side of confidentiality, and, and of course, there's a kind of cultural issue going on here. You know, judges were lawyers, our lawyers, uh, and they're used to dealing with information and confidence. Uh, and uh, so, so they, there's a kind of high regard for keeping, keeping stuff uh, confidential. Uh, and also, that if you're a judge dealing with these things, particularly at an interim stage, there's going to be a, a consciousness of the fact that once information is published, confidentiality is destroyed. Now we know that in the misuse of private information sphere, there's a little bit of wrinkle about that. It doesn't necessarily go completely, but confidential information, once the necessary quality of confidence in loss is gonna go. So that, that's a part of the factor in thinking, what's the culture of the court when you get in there is thinking what the judge is gonna do. It's like that temptation, as they say, to hold the ring, just keep it going to trial. Of course, trial means money, time, costs. Um, if you're looking at the what confidential, confidentiality, what's the nature of the information? How confidential is it? Exactly like private information cases. What are you actually talking about here? How sensitive is it? What's the court going to protect it? And in terms of this, this context with employee, employee type disclosures, the court's going to be looking at the obligations which are, in, in, uh, are imposed. And that's been talked about by, uh, by Paris and by, and by Beth. The implied duty itself will be one matter, but that there can be expressed contractual duties and then express duties in a settlement agreement. And I see these as a kind of hierarchy of duties. Uh, and, and the higher you go up the, the tier, the harder it's going to be to show a public interest uh, reason for publishing. So skipping on to contractual duties, there's a bit. of Wales uh, and Associated Newspapers case about the Prince of Wales diaries um, the, the, it is the kind of linchpin of how you approach this. You don't just look at whether the information is on a matter of public interest. You've got to say, well, is it so much in the public interest that the duty of confidence owed by contract should be breached? So it's a double whammy. It could all be very well. The whole thing could be in a general sort of sense in the public interest. But what you need to get over is into the point that the, it's so in the public interest that the very duty of confidence should be overridden. And the Saab and Dangate uh, case, which appears on Bailey for some reason as Angate, uh, is, is an interesting sort of example of this where you, you, you've got the, the in fact, in fact, it's people who are brought in, private investigators are hired and brought in to investigate possible regulatory breaches and they find them. So they want to go to the regulators. Um, they, 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 in fact, the court failed, the, to, found the claimants had failed to show that they'd gone to the media. Of course, it's part of the questions here is if you're the, if you're the person seeking to stop this stuff, do you go against the media or do you go against the person with whom you've got the contract or possibly uh, both. Uh, the public interest failed in, in that case. Um, next slide, please, Ray. This is just the tip of the iceberg. And I'm sorry if you can hear noise in the background. That's the cat who's expecting to be fed. 
um, the, in the Mionis case, this was an agreement at the end of a, of a defamation claim, but basically the defendant said, I'm not going to publish anything about you ever again. It's, it's pretty much where it was. And the court said that that was enforceable. It didn't matter if there was something that in, 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 in Article 10 reason for talking about the claimant again. Once you'd entered into a settlement agreement, and, and the interesting uh, emphasis in the middle of that, 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 that paragraph there from Mionis, the, where the relevant contracts on the settlement of litigation with the benefit of expert legal advice on both sides, uh, there's got to be a strong case. You've got bargaining, you've got parties who, con who conclude a contract, including confidentiality, and the court is really going to, um, going to uphold it. Uh, Ray, we can, we can skip the next one, which is just a bit more from me on this and move on to the ABC case. And this is one of Jonathan's uh, cases. ABC and the Telegraph media later revealed to be Arcadia and Philip Green. Again, this, this is where a whole series of NDAs have been signed. And again, you've got the court recognising the weight that's going to apply if you've got an obligation of confidentiality in a settlement agreement. Again, it's in the sort of in the middle of that, that that's a quote, it's a sentence starting, provided, provided the agreement's freely entered into without improper pressure, and I would just put a bit of emphasis on improper pressure or any other vitiating factor, and with the benefit of legal advice, basically the court um, will enforce it. There are get outs there for allowing to, um, disclosures to the police, allowing disclosure to the regulatory bodies. And of course, uh, any solicitor who's advising on NDAs will have in mind the SRA guidance um, issued in uh, March of 2018 and updated in November of 2020 about what you can and can't do. Um, and I'll pass on, given the time constraints, without comment about whether there's really equal bargaining power um, or unfair prejudice in that kind of case. So on the side of the publication of the public interest, this is part of my, my, my general theme here is about you can't just look at the generalities, you've got to look at the specifics. It's a point that Paris made right at the very beginning. The fact that something is in the public interest doesn't mean that everything is. You, you've got to drill down into what's the, the detail. You've got to look at the information itself. There's always this big question of, is it in the public interest to disclose it to the public? Why not go to the police? Why not go to some proper authority? And of course, you've got, then you've got the double whammy. If it's gone to the police or a body that's investigating, why don't you just let them do their job? Uh, and that's a theme that's been that's run that's run for many years. Going back to John Frankham and the, the, the Mirror trying to publish things which should have, they said you can go to the jockey club but you can't tell your readers. Uh, and what details can you put in? I mean, you can't, as I say, you can't be whiffly waffly about this. And I know it was a misuse of private information case, but the Cliff Richard case, Sir Cliff. Um, it was in the public interest to talk about historic allegations of abuse and, and, and all of those topics, but it was not in the public interest to name a particular person who hadn't been charged as being the subject of a search warrant and have helicopters outside its house. And, and just a note and a reminder here that if you're thinking in terms of defamation and the Section 4 defence that Jonathan's talked about, you don't have to just have to think about it at the beginning of the case. You've got to look at it as things change. You get a complaint from somebody, you get more information. There's an inquiry which reports. You've got to look into whether or not what you originally thought was in the public interest um, is still in the public interest. And the simple message here, which I've written in on, my, on my copy of the slides, is think, think before you publish. Uh, you've got to think about it. Um, some of the practical issues I've picked up on the next slide, just which I'll skate over very briefly. I'm going to come back to one and four briefly. The second point I just note here, confidential sources. If you're dealing with somebody and you want to protect them, you've got to be very careful from a media point of view, because, of course, things that employers will come after you for is disclosure of documents and disclosure of the identity sources. We've seen it down the years. Ashworth, Broadmoor, those kind of cases going right back to X and Morgan Grampy and trying to find who it is, who's the leaker is the kind of thing that can happen against the media. Third party rights, just to note that the judge in the Telegraph case was very interested in what's the attitude of the complainants. Do they want this stuff to be made public, even if the, uh, the details are anonymized? So those are the kind of things just to have in mind. But flipping to the next slide, uh, contacting the subjects of the allegations. This is a really big point. Now, the obvious question, in the old days, people might have thought about not going to the subject of the allegations before publication. Why? Because it would give them the chance to apply for an injunction. Why give them the chance? 
but more and more the culture is seen, and this goes back again to the culture of the courts, basic fairness to give somebody the chance to comment before you publish something. And more and more it's being seen not just by the courts, but by journalists as being a basic requirement of good journalism. What are the ethics of journalism? That, um, that Strasbourg talk about. What is the duty to verify which ordinarily exists? Do you always have to go? Now, Serafin, one of the things that Serafin did in the Supreme Court was make absolutely plain that it is not an invariable requirement for Section 4 defence to go to the claimant, but they go on to say it's going to always be considered. Essentially, you've just got to think about it, do I have to go to the claimant? And if not, the sub, say the claimant, they're not a claimant, the subject of the allegation, do I need to contact them? If not, why not? What is it because they won't know, they won't be able to say, I can't contact them, they won't speak to us. There's got to be, I think, a good reason not to contact before you'll get away with it. And, and as the Le Show case, uh, Johnson's recent case shows, failure to contact the claimant before publication can be fatal. The internal code of one of the newspapers said it's good journalistic practice for any potentially damaging stories to be put to the subject before publication. A whistleblowing story almost by definition is going to be damaging. If your own, if your own internal code says you should go, you've got to have a really good reason not to go. And they hadn't thought about it, or at least they couldn't show that, show that they had. Think point, message point, know your own codes. Look at the professional standards to which you're, um, which you're subject. Penultimate slide. <clears throat> please, Ray. This is a real trend now about keeping notes and records. Can you document your thinking in terms of public interest? Nick Lynn Jay, who's now in charge of the Media and Communications List, and Warby Jay have both said in recent cases how important contemporaneous notes um, are. Now, in the show, that, 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 that it, I, I, just, I, rec I recommend a, a read of this. It's recent. It's a sort of slightly sad, sad story. Journalists giving evidence um, some years after uh, without any contemporaneous documents or virtually no contemporaneous, contemporaneous documents, two documents and a few emails. Uh, and the judge takes the approach of saying, look, in almost any other sphere, people have to document their decisions. Lawyers, doctors, all sorts of people have to document. And it's not unrealistic, he says, to expect documents to be available to record or at least shed some light on decisions as to what was identified. Now, the judge accepted in that case that the journalists were trying to give an honest account, um, but, but were the impression from Le Show and, and also from Sikri, which was uh, uh, Warby J as he then was, you've got the sensation that the court is a bit skeptical about whether you really thought as a, as a media organization, you really thought about this pre-publication because if you had, you should document it in some way. And there's that slight impression that the lawyers have come up with the defence and they've tried to run it. And then you get the witnesses in their witness statements trying valiantly to support it. Um, but really, it's, it's, a, it's a, gosh, I was going to go Latin there, post hoc. It's, it's, it's an after the event construction rather than a genuine reflection of what happened at the time. So notes and records can be used. And I think this is, this is for me, seems to be a real cultural change. And then finally, just the very last slide, this is just to nose. Uh, we've been talking about civil remedies. There, there was a question, in fact, on the chat line about whether or not there can be a breach of the Official Secrets Act. The short answer to that is yes, it depends. I mean, that we, we obviously don't have time today to talk about the, how the structure of the OSA works, um, but, but, but it can. Um, there can, there can be a, a criminal liability. Just to note this, uh, uh, the proposals are the government's consulting at the moment on the Law Commission proposal. The Law Commission, after a lot of consultation, came up with the idea there should be a public interest defence. Great idea. The government doesn't think there should be. We're not convinced the Law Commission's recommendations strike the right balance. If anybody is interested in that area and has the time to respond to the consultation, um, the links are there. It's, it's open till the 22nd of July. And I think it would be, in terms of public interest and giving it real welly, in the criminal sphere, um, there's an opportunity there. Now, I I've, I've think I even I ran over my time, sorry about that. Um, we're 5.15. I don't know whether we've got any pressing questions, Paras, uh, you were monitoring the Q&A. Yeah, just um, uh, Heather, I think you, you picked up on it. One of our attendees um, has asked about disclosure potentially breaching other obligations. And I know you touched on that in, in your talk. Um, just just for, for, for the individual who uh, posited that question, from, from an employment perspective, um, you, you'll appreciate Section 193 um, excludes members of the intelligence services from protection for whistleblowing. Um, but if you're not talking about a potential employee or worker 
for one of those agencies, um, potentially uh, the OSA would impose criminal liability because there isn't a public interest exemption, as far as I'm aware, um, within the, the Act itself. But aside from that, um, Heather, um, you're, you're quite right, we've, we've overrun a little bit. Um, so I think uh, with that, we, we, um, we can move on and let everyone go. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think the, let's just end with a big thank you. Thanks, obviously, to Paris and Jonathan and Beth and to Ray, who behind the scenes has been organising all of this. And thanks to all of those of you who've attended. And uh, we hope to hear from you soon. And we'll, I'm sure we can carry on the dialogue after this session. So thanks, everybody. And goodbye.